Scripture frequently addresses the future as we would expect as we are in this present age looking forward to what is to come. And the book of Hebrews does this a lot as it's talking about our past history, what we have with Jesus Christ, but then it's looking and does a comparison between Jewish religion and Christianity and it's talking to people who know Christ as Savior and says this, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the covenant, to the sprinkled blood. That therefore... Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is who we worship. This is the one who loves us and gave his life for us and so that we could be with him. As we sing to begin with, it says he's a wonderful, merciful Savior. Would stand together, please, as we sing together. Precious Redeemer and Friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor. continues the thoughts of looking backwards and forward and tells us the way that we need to live our lives. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Christ the solid rock I stand. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out. talking about the past and the present and future. This sheet has to do with the future, and then we have our annual meeting coming up on the 24th, two weeks from today. So opportunity to sign up for things that you'd like to bring to share as we'll be having a chilly brunch and then having our meeting afterwards. We talked about maybe having it later, but the board said, you know, we're going to be smelling the food, we'll be hungry, we'll be ready to eat. So, so it's a chilly brunch, lunch, so you've got some opportunity to sign up for some other fixings, or if you have questions, ask our deaconess, Carol A. Strike, about it. A lot of things will be taking place in two weeks. As we back up a little bit, there's some other things that will be taking place. We've got opportunities to serve by taking down the Christmas decorations. Uh, we have ladies who are working on the blood drive, but you can come and get, donate blood on the, this Tuesday. Keep that in mind. And then next Sunday, we're going to have a special emphasis on the sanctity of human life. Um, Hannah Nelson will be sharing during the worship service and then during the Sunday school a longer time, talking about the very vital issue of uh, right to life and um, about the importance and sanctity of it from, some people say, should say it from the womb to the tomb, that every aspect of life is important to God. And so we'll be celebrating that next week. I want to thank Gloria for playing the piano this morning. Jean is gone. She's helping take care of the grandkids as Mark is up at a youth retreat up in northern Wisconsin. And I have a good idea who's going to be much more tired after this weekend. It's not going to be Mark. You know, I talked to her last night. She's kind of like, okay, yeah, I'm here. And they're just uh, constantly, so she's uh, 
Keep her in prayer as she's working with the kids and helping fun. Thank you, Gloria, for filling in. Ushers, would you come, please? So we can worship by giving of our offerings, and Cliff is going to be leading us in prayer as we talk to our Father. Our Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for uh, all the love that you have shown to us. We thank you, Lord, that you are willing to give yourself as a sacrifice for our sin, to pay the penalty that we could not pay. Lord, it, it, it brings us together as brothers and sisters here in this church. Uh, we are a family, Lord, and we gather together to give praise and worship to you and to hear uh, your uh, word preached to us, to educate us, to inspire us, and to encourage us. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And even now, as we continue in worship through gifts and offerings, Lord, that they would be pleasing in your sight and that they would be um, a blessing to your ministry and the outgoing of your word. Thank you for this day, and thank you for all that have gathered here to worship together. For tonight, name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Side room. Scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 5, as Jesus is laying down principles for the kingdom as he's sharing the, the, the good news of what he has come to do, but he also talks about some of the expectations, and he's changing some of the things from what people heard, said, you've heard it this way, but I'm telling you something differently. And I'll get in further as we get through and explore more of the, the Beatitudes and then the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, but he begins with the Beatitudes. The blessings, the, the things that you, expectations, what God feels are important. Uh, Tracy Dykeman is going to come and read that for us. So if you'd like to follow along as she reads from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, or you can simply listen as she reads. The Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those words are timeless. As Jesus talks about the, the people who have been persecuted beforehand and the persecution that is undergoing now, time, but also in the future. And that these things, words will become even more true, even as we progress towards the end of time, the end of the age, as we understand that there will be more and more difficulty. And God says, here's what the blessing that he wants to pour out upon you, and what he wants to share with people, and how we are to follow, and some of the things that we desire to ask God for. Um, it's, as Gloria picked out the songs for this week, she picked out ones that fitting with the new year and the challenge for us, and as we think about it, and they're very appropriate for our time now as we look forward to the future, however long that future might be, whether it's two decades, two weeks, or even longer, or in between, or shorter, we don't know, but it says what we need to do and the priorities we need to keep in mind. So this song is, it says that we need to take a stand for Jesus. That's our first and foremost priority. That's why we exist. That's why God allows us to be on earth, is that we desire to share who he is and take a stand. For him. So as the song even says, stand, we do that literally, but also we do that spiritually as we desire to stand up for Jesus. So, and Michael, we appreciate it. Their talents that they come and share with us in that way, and their their ministries, and helping us as we worship God. It's very encouraging that many people have picked up Bible reading schedules. So, I'm trusting that you did more than just pick them up, because we reprinted some, but you're actually putting it in practice and doing some reading. So, we're going to have kind of a spontaneous thing. I don't know if anybody's ready or thinking about it, but I'll talk a little bit longer. So we got a few minutes that we want to just share some things that you may have been reading this past week or, or past 10 days in the new year. Um, so think about it a little bit. I started a different reading schedule, which has me in Genesis, and then Matthew, and then it, into, it brings in some of the Psalms, like on each Sunday, that's scheduled reading. So I did a cross-section, and was reading about Abraham and just a what I wrote about it, and just the amazement of what 
he did when God called him, I want you to sacrifice your son. And just picturing it like, okay, he's just ready to put the blade into his kid, and the, he hears God speak, and, just, and he's not freaked, but he's just so relieved that God is not making him kill his son. But he thought, and even as the New Testament commentates on it, said that he believed that Isaac would come back from the dead. That he's told his servants, we'll come down other again, both of us. Even though God had told him you're going to kill your son, he believed God could raise the dead. That picture for us of Jesus, too, of God. Okay. What have you to share? What is something that you've read? Let's spur the moment. Wheels are turning. Thinking, anybody have something that real quick? Or you've just been faithful in reading, hopefully? Anybody? I know a lot of you picked up the thing, so it's more than just putting it there. Anybody? Feel like an auctioneer going once? Linda? Okay, good. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Find a subject and read through what the Bible has to say. Don't fear all this other stuff, but fear God. Jeff? Anybody else? Something that you've been reading or something that maybe you just thought of? Even verse, uh, verses with songs. Yesterday, Jeff and I were going back and forth on songs that we heard as we were at the men's breakfast. Like, oh yeah, we just heard this one. Then we're going back and forth about different things about how what God is doing, what he says to us, the message. Anybody else? gives us a seat at the table. We deserve it because of what Jesus did. Watching by on the on our video um, may not have heard everything, but people were talking about fear, don't fear, fear God, put our trust in him about the, how God welcomes us and about how we do doers of the word. Anybody else want to chime in? I encourage you to continue reading. Maybe if you haven't started, start someplace. And it, even though most of these start at January 1, you can start some other time too and just keep track of it. And uh, I'm reading ahead, so sometimes I... But, okay, I'm done with that. So I remember 
where I am, I'll mark your Bible. It's fine to mark the Bible, but just dig into God's Word. And that's one of the things that we need more than ever in the gifts here. Let's pray again before we do look into God's Word from this one specific text. God, we thank you that you speak to us. You can speak to all of us, and that you've given the Bible to all of us so that we can read it and understand it, and you've given the Holy Spirit who can help us and to apply it. And now as we look into another passage of your word, that you would uh, help me to communicate what you want communicated and help us hear what you want communicated, and that again we'll be hearers but also doers, and that will still that we won't fear, but we recognize who we are in, in the privilege we have of being your children. In Jesus' name we pray. So let's jump right into the text. It's Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. It's one of the parables that Jesus shares. He's taught many parables, and this one he even gives it, there's an introduction to the parable and a purpose for the parable, which is extremely helpful to him. So Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God have justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The parable is unusual in several ways. One of the first is that Jesus gives the intended interpretation, even before telling the parable. So we're not left to try to figure out, okay, what does he mean? What is he trying to communicate? He doesn't always do that, or even often do that, or even a good bit of the time. The interpretation really has a dual intent. He says the first thing he says is that people should pray, should always pray. The second is that we shouldn't give up. And we put the two together as they cross over, so the Lord is telling us that we shouldn't give up when it comes to prayer. Keep on praying. The parable is also unusual that it has kind of a unique cast of characters, and many of Jesus' stories have unique people that he created that have some connection to what's going on in people's lives. But this one is even more so because it says there's a judge who doesn't care about God or about people, and he readily admits it. That I don't care about God or about people. I don't fear God or care about men. So the, I can imagine the statement has the crowd going. They're thinking, okay, yeah, there's reality here, but to, for a person to admit that and say that out loud or to say that readily, that society, that would have been a really bad thing. Today, that's really acceptable and even applauded. But back in that day, people said, I don't fear God. I don't care about people. More people today would be upset about that second thing. So you don't care about people? Terrible. But he said, I don't care about God. I don't care about people. And so people see the humor in even the way the judge presents, I mean, the way Jesus presents the judge in talking about himself. And he just plainly says that he's unfeeling, he's uncaring, he's only interested in himself. So the judge is the official to whom people go to settle their grievances and their arguments. And cases are often settled by the person who gives the most money to the judge, the biggest bribe that they can hand money under the table. So the crowd would also have a very visceral reaction to judges because they know that many of them pervert justice. And their blood pressure would rise and their hearts would beat faster. And it would be like the way the Jews responded at every time that the story of Esther was told. You know, there's the the bad guy, the one who's wanting to exterminate the Jews, a guy named Haman. So whenever the story was read and the name Haman would come about, people would boo and hiss 
and, you know, because he's the villain, and the, they would get it into the story. So I'm sure people want to do that now as they're listening to Jesus talk about this unjust judge. Enter the widow, a very sympathetic figure, particularly in that time when the government really didn't take care of people who were needy, and they did very few means of support, as the husband was the sole breadwinner. So if the husband was gone, she's basically doomed to poverty. She's going to be very vulnerable. And widows could be just shoved to the edges of society, and every once in a while a few crumbs might be thrown their way if they don't have family members to take care of them. And it probably seems like this is the case here, where she's really all by herself. And the caring listener would feel sorry for this woman who has a very difficult problem. Well, the meeting of the two goes something like this. The woman comes to the judge and wants him to side in her favor against her adversary. The judge may have listened to her first appeal for justice, but when she didn't pony up a bribe and just give him something uh, on the side, he just dismissed her. Just go away. I've got other things to do. And either she didn't know the game, how it was to be played, or she was unwilling to play the game, maybe because she had some scruples or some other ways, but she wasn't going to give in to the judge's rule. But Jesus emphasizes one very important thing about this woman. She wasn't a quitter. She figures the squeaky wheel gets the grease, the loudest noise from the nest gets the food from the mama bird. So she confronts the judge again and again, whether he's at his judge's bench. She'll maybe push up the members or and said, here's what I want, here's what I need. She invades his space when he's walking to and from his house. She'll look for him and find him at, at the market. Uh, she jumps out from behind trees when he's not suspecting her. And she always says, she's unwavering in her pursuit. She said, give me justice with my adversary. Well, the judge refuses each and every attempt. And he's getting annoyed and he dismisses her with, again, just the wave of the hand. Maybe if he has some flunkies there who can help push her away. He tries avoidance. If he sees her coming down the street, he'll cross to the other side and maybe go down and try to take a different route. He does everything he can to try to avoid bumping into her, but he can't get away from her because she keeps showing up and she keeps coming at him again and again and again. To the judge, she's a nuisance. She's an annoying woman, a really annoying woman. She's a bona fide pest. She's like fingernails on chalkboard. Board. She's just as irritating as can be. So the judge finally decides that he's going to give her justice. Now, it's not out of the kindness of his heart. He hasn't son suddenly had a come-to-Jesus moment where he said, gets saved. So, oh, man, I've been really wrong this whole time, so I need to make things right. And because now of my relationship with God, I'm going to be kind to you. He's not even motivated by memories of dear old mom, his sainted mother, and what she was like, and just, oh, imagining what it would have been like for her. No. The only thing that matters for him, it's life is a checks and balances. He figures, she wants some money. I want some peace and quiet. I want to get back to my normal business. In order for me to get back to my normal business, she's got to get some money. She's got to get justice from her adversary. So I'll give it to her, because she's just nagging me in this barrage I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to be worn out. I won't be of use to anybody. I won't make any more income. So where will I be? It's as good as reason as any to give her justice. Just because she's loud and talking and constantly there and constantly nagging. That's what he's thinking. So in the end, the woman gets what she wants because she's been determinedly and desperately asked. One of the temptations in interpreting parables, even as we think about what Jesus said, is to make each and every aspect of the parable mean something, that it is something specific. Well, we can't do that with this parable. Because if we were to do that, said, okay, the judge represents God. Well, we're in very dangerous territory if we say the unjust judge is God, uh, because it, there's really a contrast and comparison. Because God is nothing like the judge. They're and the judge is nothing like God. The judge wanted to keep the needy woman at a distance as she was in irritation. The Lord doesn't view people as irritation. The judge wanted to keep her at a distance. God would welcome people who admit their needs and invites them to come to him. The judge said, I don't care about people. 
No, you can't take those words and put those in God's mouth. He's never said that. I don't care about people. God deeply cares for people, and especially his children. He doesn't view us as strangers, but as sons and daughters. His love is so deep, unending, and lavish that he granted us the high privilege of being his children. We are told, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And then the Lord describes his attitude toward people. He said, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget. And we're thinking, that'd be pretty rare, weird, and strange. But even the, these kind of mothers might forget. He said, I won't forget you. I will never forget you. Behold, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. So he's carrying us with him at all times. We sing that song about our names are written on his hands with the, the marks of the nail. Christ has his names on our hands, and he carries us with him. The Heavenly Father cares about people, and it's best demonstrated in the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus brings the parable to a close. And it's emphasized in verse 6, where the Lord has Luke record now, says, and the Lord said. So he's wrapping it up. It says, the Lord said, he's, Jesus drawing the application. Here's what he says again. Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? First of all, the Lord says, listen to what the unjust judge says. It's not that the judge exhibits the proper attitude. It's not that God will give us what we ask so we'll stop bothering him, much like a parent who caves to a child five minutes before supper and the kid says, candy, 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 candy. And the parent finally said, take your candy and go away. That's not what God has to say or why he's doing it. And Jesus points out what God's intent is doing, why he's doing it, by asking two questions at verse 7. And the first one is phrased in such a way that there's only one possible answer. And the answer to that question is yes. The question is, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Most assuredly, the answer is God will bring justice, yes. If an unjust judge can bring justice, certainly the judge of the entire world who judges rightly and fairly, will be able to bring real, true justice. Now, the second question is also phrased so that there's only one answer. And this time, it's a resounding no. The question is, will he keep putting them off? Will God keep putting off his chosen ones? Will God keep putting off his people? No, God won't keep putting them off. He said, God will give them justice and it will be done quickly. Now, too often we think about it's going to be very soon. Quick. we got to do quick, quick, quick. It's going to be soon. It doesn't necessarily mean soon, but it refers to something that happens speedily and unexpectedly when it happens. It's like the thief who enters the home at night when the homeowner is unprepared. The Lord's bringing of justice will happen quickly and catch unprepared those who are to be judged. So it will be speedily. When it happens, it's going to be here and gone and done. So God says he will take care of it, and he will bring justice, and it will be, as we're told about even Christ's coming, it's going to be in a blink of an eye. It's going to be that fast. So Jesus, the Son of God, says his people, his followers, those who place their trust in him, those who love and serve him, will get justice. And it's nothing like what many people today holler and clamor for about being justice. Because all too often today's world Justice is determined by feelings, by what we, our emotions. And that's what we think real justice is. It's not a weighing of true justice, not, but it's a different kind of justice. He said, God will bring about justice, what is completely right and fair and for his people, and also for the people who are going to get the opposite of being rewarded, who are going to be condemned in hell, because God is right, fair, and just, and it, his justice is not blind. 
as we say, it's supposed to be, so you administrate it fairly. But God is sees wide open, and he administers justice the way that it's supposed to be, in fairness, in righteousness, and justice, and out of love. So when will this take place? You've alluded to it. Jesus alluded to it. When will this prayer be answered for justice? Well, the giving of justice is tied to Christ's second coming. If you back up to chapter 17, a lot of chapter 17 has to do with Christ's second coming. He's talking about what the times will be like and how life will be like and what is going to happen. And that at the very end, the very last verse, doesn't sound very great, but it says where there's a dead body, there the vultures will gather. So he's talking about the end times and this is going to happen. And then he says the word then. Then Jesus told a parable. So it could refer to sometime later that Jesus told a parable because not necessarily everything in the Gospels is right after the, the other thing that just previously happened. But there are intervals of time. But it certainly seems that what Jesus said was closely tied to the previous. Like he just gets done talking about the end times. Then he tells him a story related to it. And even if that's not the case, the, the thematically they are very much connected as he's talking about the end, the end times. Here's how to be ready for the end times. And then the last verse of what Jesus said here in this parable, talking about the Son of Man, it's got this connection going all the time. So he said that's happening in the future. Meanwhile, in the intervening period between then and now, God's chosen ones cry out to him day and night. That's how he's portraying the follow, his followers. They pray and pray and pray and pray, seeking justice. So the question is, how can we be persistent and persevere in prayer? Because Jesus said you should always pray and not give up. We learn from the widow. In reading, some people described her as ash, as vehement, relentless, importune, words that we might not use a whole lot, but better put, she's persistent. She perseveres. She keeps on praying and bringing the request before the judge. And we are to keep on praying and bringing our request before God. Jesus tells another story about the issue of prayer where he addresses the same thing, the same attitude. He tells it after he gives the Lord's Prayer in the, earlier in the book of Luke. And he asks his listeners to do this. Imagine you have a friend. He's not saying people, you don't have a whole lot of friends and you, you aren't the kind of person who has a friend, but imagine you have a friend. And you, right away, somebody would pop into your mind and said, and you go to that friend. So, and you're going to the friend. The reason you're going to that friend is because somebody showed up to your help. And for some reason, your cupboards are bare, the refrigerator is empty, and you have no food, and this person is starving. It's at midnight, so it's late, and he wants something to eat. So you go to your friend and tell the person the situation, can you give me some food? The friend says, go away. It's late. The kids and I are all sleeping together in the same bed. We're having this camping kind of thing. It's really hard to get up. Just, I can't be bothered right now. I don't want to get up and give you anything. Just go away. In modern days, we can picture it, the guy has a ring doorbell. So he can see and he can communicate. And he's talking to him. He said, just go away. He doesn't have to get out of bed. He doesn't have to yell. But he said, just get out of here. Jesus said the friend won't get up and share food because of the friendship, but because of the petitioner's boldness, your boldness, because you keep asking, he'll get up and give you what's needed. Then Jesus says that's the same way God is, because we keep asking, we keep bringing to him. And then after that, that story, Jesus says that we should ask, seek, and knock. He says for everyone who asks, receives, and everyone who seeks, finds, and he who knocks will have the door open. And each of those are in the continuous, repeated action. It's not just ask and be done, knock once you're done, seek, yeah, we're done. But it's ask, seek, knock. Continually do that continually be pounding on the door. One man described it this way. Until you have stood for years knocking at a locked door, your knuckles bleeding, you do not really know what prayer is. Until you have stood 
for years knocking at a locked door, your knuckles bleeding, and you don't really know what prayer is. Because we're too content with saying, okay, God's not going to answer that. Or because, oh, I got it. All I asked for was a faith. Answer. They said, you've got to just keep knocking and pounding and pounding pounding because God tells us to do that. Be persistent. And then Jesus continues teaching on prayer at that point by using an illustration of a father and son. He says, if the son asks for a fish, something good to eat, will the father give him a snake? Here, eat this. One that's alive and wriggling and poisonous. Or if the son asks for an egg, would he give him a scorpion? Something else that's poisonous. And Jesus concludes this way, if you then, though you are evil, there are probably some people who are his followers, but he's basically saying if you people who have this sinful, evil nature in your heart know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who seek him? And then in Matthew's account, it says that he will give good gifts to those who seek him, that you ask and seek him. Jesus reassures us that the Father will give us what is good and right at his time. So prayer is talking with God. It's a continual conversation, one that's based on our understanding of our need, but more importantly, the, the knowledge that we can't do it. We can't do life by ourselves. It's a repeated conversation where we tell the Lord the same thing. Keep going, the same thing. We present our needs again and again. And our most basic needs are the same all year long, all life long. So we might say, well, I've told them that before. Yeah. Well, he says, keep, keep coming. Whatever the request is, justice, he's talking about there, justice. Well, God, right at the end, that's what we often cry out for. God, do, can you straighten out this mess? He said, yes. Keep asking, keep praying. And their hearts are crying out day and night. In another place where it's talking about prayer in a similar vein, it says, that for persistent, persevering prayer, it puts it in three words. Pray without ceasing. Or never stop praying, another translation does it. And then one translation does it one better because it puts it in just two words. Pray continually. That's from 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Really one of the toughest commands, even as we're talking about, one of the toughest commands is to implement is to keep on praying, to pray without ceasing, to pray persistently. So it's just three or two words. One source said that the word is described basically a military tactic where they'll advance and they'll attack. And they'll withdraw, regroup, attack again. And they'll withdraw, regroup, and attack again. And they keep going through that process until the, the victory is won, until they have achieved their objective. They said the word also could be used for a hacking cough. It's frequent and repeated, but it's not all the time, even as the military didn't attack all the time. Can you imagine what it would be like if a person had nonstop cough? That would be really irritating. It's bad enough when we have a hacking cough and we then bouts of it 10, 20, 30 minutes apart or more, but it just continually comes at us. And when it comes to prayer, we're connected to God all time. Prayer isn't just once a day and done. We should attack and cough really throughout the day. We take time to talk with God about our requests and burdens as well as our praise. And there may be times when the exercise of it, it's protracted, it's longer at one particular time. Like when the need is great and the burden for others and for self is great. The idea of pray without ceasing is also to be understood as pray without omission. Means you actually pray, but just don't admit stuff and just pray about everything. He says in another spot. So we pray about this, that, and everything. It's kind of a stream of consciousness. It's like the way grandkids, our grandkids pray anyway. They pray at meals and say, Thank you for the food and for our family, for Papa and Nana that they could come, for the fact that I got Christmas present and it was a pink dress and I really like pink dresses. And this is the girls, obviously, praying. Um, but they, they, they thank you for this, that, for everything else, and you just whatever they think of, and then the and they're done. Somewhere along the line, we stop doing that. We stop bringing whatever comes into our mind to God. We just, oh, okay, he's maybe not concerned. There's a whole bunch of reasons why we don't. And we're not. And Stephen Cole highlights some. He says, there are a number of reasons why we're prone to lose heart and quit praying. Sometimes we assume that, we're too, that we are competent to handle things in our own strength. 
This is especially a danger when it's a task that we do repeatedly. We hop in the car and head off on a trip without a thought of prayer because we're driven safely for many years. We forget that we depend on the Lord for protection. We go to work every day and do our jobs without prayer because we know how to do it. We forget that we're dependent on God to do jobs competently. This is even true of spiritual tasks, such as preaching or leading in worship or anything else you do to, so often that it becomes routine. Or if God has given you a strong natural ability, it is easy to do it without prayer because you know how to do it and you can do it well. And so we think, okay, we don't need to bring those up. But there are other reasons. It may be because of perceived delays of God answering and getting the answer we anticipate. Because, because can be because of difficulties or because we don't think God is concerned about that particular area or the small and mundane details of life. Maybe it's because we don't think he's really listening. Or maybe we just get forgetful and we just don't take time to pray or we've got so much other to do. Oswald Chambers said this, We can hinder the time that should be spent with God by remembering that we have other things to do. And we therefore say, I haven't the time. Of course you don't have the time. Take time, strangle some other interests, and make time to realize that the center of power in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ and his atonement. Pray. We get into problems when we don't go to the doctor, when we don't go to the mechanic, or those kind of things. We get into more problems if we don't go to God. We lose our spiritual vibrancy. Adrian Rogers put it maybe really simply. He said, prayerless spirit of independence from God. You don't like it when people in the world say, I don't need God. But we're saying the same thing. He said, well, we're not going to pray and talk to God. I don't need you. I can do it by myself. And it's hard to wait. Caitlin was four years old, and she was growing more and more impatient, and she felt time was passing by, and she was getting old. She'd been praying for a sibling, and nothing was happening. She wasn't getting a sibling. So she su suggested to her mom that maybe if they prayed together and they prayed out loud, that God would answer. So mom that would touch her heart and they prayed together for a, a, a sibling and it had to be a heartwarming moment to touching and so as soon as they're done saying the amen Caitlin said what did he say and mom explained that answers aren't always immediate sometimes they take a long time which Caitlin's response was you mean we're talking to an answering machine and it can feel that way sometimes doesn't it we're just, okay, he puts us on hold. And sometimes we are put on hold. But God's always hearing, he's always listening, but it doesn't say that he'll get it right away. We are to keep praying. Keep on praying, pray, 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 pray. Um, I am, when it comes to golf, I am, what's the best word to describe it? Terrible? But, but it's still fun to go out with Nate, and we do it, and I do what uh, Tiger Woods sometimes said about he plays army golf, where it's left, right, left, right, and I go on the left side, maybe to the rough, then the right side, and go back and forth. Never, it sometimes it goes down the middle. But we, we comment about going on the round, maybe it's nine holes or 18 holes, and we're like, still with bad shots, and there's like, uh, and then it seems like towards the end, all of a sudden, there's a couple good shots, and Nate's kind of like, Feel a little better, saying, "Yeah, I think I'll come out again." Just there's just one or two good shots. Like, okay, I can do this. Now, if we really were serious and we wanted to play better golf, improve even slightly, we'd have to play more often, practice, swing the clubs, go through maybe some lessons, do a whole bunch of other stuff, to, so that we could play and play and play and play, and we would improve. At least you usually do when you do something repeatedly. Prayer is the same way as golf. Think about golf again. How hard can it be a ball that's just sitting there? How hard can it be to put it in a cup that's on the ground that's motionless? It's not like trying to hit a 100-mile or 80-mile-an-hour fastball that's hurting, hurtling towards you. The rules of the, are simple. Hit the ball, get it in the cup. Sit. The rules of prayer are pretty simply. Talk to God. That's it. How hard can it be? Here's what one man said. Anyone who has seriously and earnestly attempted the act of prayer has found that it is not nearly as simple as it first appears to be. Well, it's simple, 
but it still takes a lot of time and effort. So the basic principles and doctrines of prayer are simple, but the execution and practice of those principles is far from simple and easy. The fact is that because prayer is such a challenging endeavor, very few of God's people ever reach the what he calls the effective and fervent prayer type of prayer that regularly and consistently sees prayers answered. The reality is, it is not that prayer does not work, but rather that we will not work at prayer. The reason more of our prayers are not answered lies in the fact that we are very often, we do not persist and persevere in our prayer lives. That is, we give up too soon. Prayer is an exercise. It is a work. It is tasking, toiling. It is testing. Simple in one regard, you just talk to God. You've got to keep doing it, and you just keep going because there's so many distractions, so many other things to do in what goes on in life. Max Lucado gave us really some practical insight about how to grow in our prayer life, to get towards that place of persistent, persevering in our prayer life. He said this, if you want to know how to deepen your prayer life, pray. Don't prepare to pray, just pray. Don't read about prayer, just pray. Don't attend a lecture or on prayer or engage in discussion about prayer, just pray. Posture, tone, and place are personal matters. Select the form that works for you, but don't think about it too much. Don't be so concerned about wrapping the gift that you never give it. Better to pray awkwardly than not at all. And if you feel you should only pray when inspired, that's okay. Just see to it that you're inspired every day. It is. Just pray. Keep praying. Keep going. And Jesus said that we should ought always to pray and never give up, never quit. Pray without ceasing. Pray, ask, seek, knock. So let's take a little bit of time to pray now. God, even as we close in prayer, even though we're not being uh, in this particular prayer or that, that it's something that we routinely put at the end of the service, part of our prayer life, we help us to grow in an understanding what it means to talk with you, that we would have a desire to pray, and that we understand the, the purpose, that we would just, even rather than just trying to learn all the stuff about prayer, is that we would just simply pray. Repeatedly, take time to be unceasing in it, whether it's, you know, Chamber said, strangle away other things, and you know, we don't spend so much time listening to the radio in the car, we don't spend so much time thinking about other stuff when we're brushing our teeth or whatever, that we say, okay, I'm going to take these moments to pray, that we'll, we'll, um, we'll be the masters of our time. Cry out to you and call out to you for justice and for the things that are necessary in this world and in our lives. We thank you, God, that we can come to you and that you are God who will give what is right because you are the Father of lights who gives everything right and good in the particular time. In your name we pray. We close with a song that says that we need to take the time to do it. Lots of times it's just that. We need to carve this into our schedule with other things. So let's stand together. Please, as we worship our God by singing about the taking time to be holy, taking time to speak off with our Lord.
Father, as we look forward to the future, we understand what is going to be happening, but we're living in the present. We need even a better understanding of the future so we can have a better understanding of the present and that we will be here to serve you and to serve others. And part of that way is by praying and that we would desire to be more persistent and persevering in prayer and that we'll practice it more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.